Definitely a great pleasure to be back in Heidelberg again for another Troopers. Uh, for anyone here who it's their first Troopers, um, you're in for a treat. It's a really good conference. Um, so my talk uh, this morning um, is on security vulnerabilities of autonomous, unmanned, and driverless vehicles. Um, and the title was already getting pretty unwieldy, so I left it there, but I'm also going to talk about connected vehicles. Um, and why do we care about this? Uh, it's because unmanned vehicles are soon going to be part of the IoT. They're going to be devices like any other on the IoT, except they're unlike others in the, in the fact that they weigh thousands of kilograms and can call, cause all kinds of physical damage and destruction um, all over the place. However, that said, in this talk, I'm not going to be focusing on network attacks because vehicles are not special in that regard. Uh, instead, I'm going to be focusing on attacks that don't require a foothold inside the platform, so something that attackers can do from outside the system. Um, I forgot to advance to my other little, little slide here. Um, very quick self-intro, um, I have an autonomous robotics background uh, in academics, um, and then when I graduated uh, with my PhD, I did a, uh, this is probably what I'm best known for, a um, international television show called Prototype This, where we basically hacked together cool demos, uh, including some autonomous vehicles. So we did one of the first autonomous aerial delivery systems, uh, that's me on the beach, uh, setting up our autonomous drone aircraft that would fly out and deliver a life preserver to a swimmer in trouble. Uh, and sometimes it would fly back again, and sometimes it wouldn't. So uh, we learned about some vulnerabilities there of our unmanned air systems. Um, and we also did driverless ground vehicles. Uh, one of the more pressing technological challenges in the, in the ground vehicle delivery space, maintaining the American lead in high efficiency pizza delivery. So this was one of our two vehicles we did. This was the local delivery system that was uh, for operating on the sidewalk and delivering pizza, the pizza pie pack. And we also did a long distance method based on a full scale autonomous vehicle. Uh, and we actually did the first ever autonomous crossing of a United States highway bridge as part of this project. But uh, you know, this, so th this, that stuff was about 10 years ago. Um, but uh, I wanted to just do a quick poll here. Um, where do people think the, the first driverless car was developed and tested? Hands up who, think it was in, who thinks it was in the United States? Don't, don't be shy. Obviously, I'm leading the question because uh, I want to say that that's not the case. Uh, it was here in Germany. Um, quick show of hands, uh, who thinks it was in the 2000s sometime? Who thinks it was this millennium? 90s? 80s? Ah, oh, you guys are very well informed. 1986. Um, this was uh, Ernst Dickmann's. The, the vehicle was called Vamors. Um, it was a, uh, based on a Mercedes van. And, uh, you know, they eventually, um, in 1995, uh, drove from Munich to Copenhagen in regular traffic at up to 175 kilometers an hour using vision only, no GPS. Pretty cool. So, you know, this is an over 30-year-old technology we're talking about. So why do we care now? Is, is this a talk like hacking Windows 3.1? No. Obviously, the technology is becoming more well adopted. Um, here's the European um, current state of things. Uh, quick, quick sort of summary. So the UK, uh, Nissan's testing autonomous Leafs in London since 2017. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover testing on public roads. Uh, the government has promised a 200 million pound research fund for driverless vehicles. So even after Brexit, that's going to be at least like 100,000 euro. Um, <laughs> in Sweden, Gothenburg is doing driverless Volvo trials uh, since December 2017 uh, through last year. Um, autonomous bus in northern Stockholm uh, since 2018. Uh, BMW here in Germany, testing 40 vehicles in Munich um, and promising, so making actually a firm promise to sell an autonomous electric vehicle for the Autobahn in 2021. We'll see if they live up to that. Volvo did live up to it with their driverless trials in Sweden. Um, autonomous bus trials in Berlin um, and in Bavaria and in France, also automated shuttles, kind of kind of low speed vehicles um, and they're working on the legislation as well to allow open road testing. Uh, and we're in the middle of an EU project autopilot, uh, which is six cities and 25 million euro. So I say the revolution is coming uh, because of the advantages. The energy efficiency in not having to haul a human driver, the fact that you don't need to take up a human's time, and the new applications that it enables. So the revolution is coming. Uh, we can't stop it. This is not like a talk saying, oh, we need to, we need to stop the revolution. Um, it's coming. but 
like everything else that humans have ever made, these systems will be hacked. And so we need to talk about it now and make sure that we make good decisions and we think about security and we make sure that uh, we don't let systems get too entrenched with flaws uh, that, that make it hard to go back on things, which we've seen everywhere in the computer industry. Uh, here are a few civil applications where these things are going to start showing up. Obviously, transportation, that's a given. Uh, the oceans are a great place for autonomous vehicles. Mapping, filmmaking, uh, commercial, commercial drones are all over the place. Places you wouldn't expect, like industrial inspections, like power lines. There's thousands of miles of them every, uh, all over the world. Um, and delivery, of course. It's not just aerial vehicles and ground vehicles. Um, Autonomous boats are going to be a big thing, especially for cargo shipping. So this is a Rolls-Royce concept. Um, they think the future of cargo shipping is unmanned because 75% of accidents uh, on the seas are caused by human error. Uh, there was one just the other day. A drunken uh, ship's captain crashed a, a giant cargo ship into a bridge in Korea. Um, however, there is a major technical challenge to be overcome in this case uh, because what happens when hardware fails? It's just on the street, you can stop and someone can come and fix it. But in the middle of the ocean, one of the main reasons that we have human crews is to fix things when they break. Um, here's a, a very recent one that was just announced. Um, Kongsberg, which is a Norwegian company, announced this boat, the Yara Birkeland, uh, which is going to be a zero emissions autonomous capable cargo ship. Uh, it's going to replace 40,000 truck trips a year. Uh, it's a fully electric vehicle. Um, and they're going to approach this slowly. So 2020, they'll run it manned. Uh, 2021, they'll down crew to a skeleton crew. And 2022, they're planning for fully autonomous operation of this ship. Uh, and in general, this, um, the priorities for deployment of unmanned systems, uh, precision agriculture. A lot of agricultural equipment even now are almost robots, like big combine, combine harvesters and so on. They follow GPS tracks and, of course, self-driving cars. And the things that are in the way that are stopping us, uh, you know, when this stuff was tested in the 1980s, why isn't it everywhere now? Um, the fact that we have shared infrastructure. So we have to deal with human drivers that are unreliable and unpredictable. Um, and the fact that we need public acceptance. Um, we need to convince people of safety and robustness. Just look at the recent um, news with the 737 MAX. As soon as people think there might be a problem, even though it's clearly the safest way to travel, uh, people get very nervous. So with that said, uh, let's talk about some failures. So here's my first example of a classic failure. Uh, this was from the first DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004. Um, this was a vehicle called Sandstorm from Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, the, uh, th this was considered to be the, w the, the front runner to win this Grand Challenge, which was a desert race from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. And um, well, it was the favorite. Did it win the Grand Challenge? No, it did not, although it did get the furthest of any vehicle, which was just a couple of miles. Uh, it got a few miles, it took a turn wrong, and then ran off the side of the road, uh, ended up on a weird angle, and caught fire. So <laughs> not an auspicious start to driverless vehicles. Um, but what went wrong? So what went wrong was DARPA really wanted this competition to succeed. So a couple of days before the race, they distributed the exact path um, that the vehicles could take. And so this team was a huge team. They had a lot of resources. Even though the prize was a million dollars for this competition, they spent many, many millions entering it. And they had their team walk the entire course with GPS trackers. And they just GPS mapped the whole thing. So they could have just done this with a straight up GPS track. But they had the, the whole thing covered in sensors. They even de developed new sensors for this competition. And so they still wanted to integrate all their technology together. When it got to that turn, the sensor readings that it was getting didn't agree with the GPS track that it had. And it had to make a decision, and it decided to trust the sensors. And it got it wrong, and it ran off the road and crashed. So the moral of the story here is deciding what the vehicle knows at any given time is a constant battle with uncertainty. And deciding the state of things correctly is absolutely key to the decision-making process. So, if we want to exploit uh, a vehicle, then it most likely subverting the state estimation process is going to be a good way to do it. Um, here's a more recent failure. Uh, this was a fatal uh, accident of, the of, the of a Tesla car in autopilot mode uh, one year ago this month. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, uh, the driver was killed. Um, 
what happened was the vehicle was in uh, dynamic cruise control mode. So it was following a vehicle in front of it, but at the same time it had auto steering for lane following. And it got to a fork in the highway. And at that fork in the highway, instead of continuing to follow the vehicle in front, it got confused by some poor lane markings. And it ran straight into that divider that divides the two forks in the highway. Now there was a, uh, at 120 kilometers per hour, now there was a crash attenuator on that divider, but it had previously been run into and it was damaged and hadn't been replaced. So um, it ended up being a terrible accident. Um, the moral of the story here is that if it had kept following the vehicle in front, that would have been great, no problem. In this case, in another case, if the vehicle in front had crashed into something, that would have been terrible. That would have caused the accident. So you have this split second choice to be made here. And this isn't a ridiculous split second choice like we see in the news, like, oh, you know, should I choose to run over an old man or a baby in a, in a carriage? You know, that's, that's ridiculous, that's not a real scenario. But this is a real scenario in a split second. Do I keep following the car in front or do I watch the lanes? Um, so fragile decision making and edge cases completely abound in this space. Um, here's just a quick look at sort of just how the structures of these vehicles work for people who don't have a robotics background. Um, there's a hierarchy of the logic behind their behavior. Um, so at the very bottom, you have a bunch of real-time control loops. They operate at thousands, um, at, at tens of kilohertz, rather, um, and uh, they do things like maintaining stability, uh, driving in a straight line, things like that. Um, above that, we have our collision avoidance. That's very, very important. Um, we have to maintain stability, then we have to stop from crashing in th into things. Then we can start looking at high level tasks like navigation and localization. Um, and then on top of that, mission task planners and reasoners and so on that uh, take advantage of what the navigation system knows. So from an attacker's perspective, attacks lower in the stack defeat everything above. If you can defeat stability, nothing else can work. If you can cause a collision, the mission can't succeed and so on. Um, however, the attack surface down low may not be very, very high because much more engineering effort is spent on guaranteed robustness at the lowest levels. Um, so the low layers may be juicier targets, but also more difficult. Here are just a couple of examples from uh, my work, uh, but they generalize to you know, general delivery tasks. First in the air, uh, the life-saving drone. Uh, at the bo bottom layer, we have PID loops um, that are trained to keep the aircraft stable based on assumptions about the environmental conditions how strong the winds are, and so on. Um, above that, in the collision avoidance case, absolutely none. This vehicle will run straight into a tree. In fact, it did. Um, and that's very, that's very common in the aerial space. The reason why there's been slow uptake uh, of, of drones in civilian airspace is because sense and avoid basically isn't there yet. Uh, above that, navigation is a g following GPS waypoints. Um, and the final uh, high level uh, task planner is to set up this bombing run, figure out where the person is to deliver the package to, and make sure it's dropped at the right point uh, to land right where the person can swim to it. Um, so a single sensor, uh, well first of all vulnerable to collision, and then the high level logic depends on one sensor, just that GPS. It's an obvious vulnerability. In the pizza delivery case, I'm going to use the local pizza delivery system because it's a little more interesting than the car. Um, because it has this low level stability because it's a two wheel balancing robot. So it needs to deal with uneven terrain on the way to the uh, thing that it's delivering and it has to deal with weight shifting when you remove pizzas from it. Suddenly the, the whole balance is affected. Uh, collision avoidance is key for this one. This one had a lot of work going to collision avoidance, dealing with dynamical obstacles, people on the sidewalk, dogs, wheelchairs, whatever. Um, Motion, uh, route, route planning was done from a self-created map, so there's a lot of navigation and localization code in there. Um, and then the high level uh, task obviously is to d deliver the pizza to the correct person. So to authenticate with the credit card and make sure no one steals the pizza. So a system like this is vulnerable to all kinds of attacks uh, such as redirection, trapping, and map confusion. Now the, uh, se uh, the sensors is the way, are the way that the system works out about the world around it. So that's where I'm going to concentrate a, a lot of uh, this talk on. Uh, there's two basic kinds. Active sensors send out some kind of uh, signal and then receive a return to gather information about the world. And passive sensors just gather information about the world without sending anything out. Um, here are some of the common sensors and where you'd find them on the vehicle. Uh, GPS, uh, obviously. Um, anything that's in the atmosphere can use GPS. 
and the sensors are on the roof usually, so they have a clear unobstructed view of the sky. Um, LiDAR is basically a, a, a laser rangefinder, so they gather a, a point cloud of distance information. Um, cameras are cheap, uh, and it's easy to slap a lot of them on a vehicle. Uh, we see in, uh, in cars some more esoteric sensors like millimeter wave radar, um, also ultrasonic transducers. Um, we want to know which way uh, absolute direction reference, so digital compass. Um, we can also use an inertial management measurement system, accelerometers and gyroscopes, uh, wheel encoders for uh, determining odometry. Uh, that's all the kinds of things that you'd find uh, on, on a ground vehicle. Uh, for other types of vehicles, you find acoustic sensors like a Doppler velocity logger for underwater vehicles, um, scanning sonar underwater, and pressure transducers both in the air and under the water. Um, sensors don't give you a perfect picture of the world, just a best guess. They have several sources of uncertainty um, that comes primarily from noise. Um, you get, you know, get a guess at the world. Uh, integrating signals gives you drift problems because that noise accumulates. Um, and then you also have a problem with latency and update rates. So when you get that informa information from the sensor, uh, there's some time elapsed and you need to figure out if that information is still true. Uh, so you model that uncertainty under certain assumptions, and if those assumptions are wrong or if someone makes them wrong, then things can fail. Uh, you try, often try to deal with this by fusing information from multiple sensors. Uh, fused data can be much more useful than that data separately. Uh, but what do you do when those sensors disagree? So your vehicle's robustness may come down, uh, like in the case of those two case study examples I mentioned before. How smart is your vehicle at discounting one single bad or adversarially attacked sensor. So in, in the attack space, there's two basic kinds. Uh, denial, just like denial of service. So preventing the sensor from recovering data that's correct. Um, and spoofing, so causing the sensor to retrieve data that's specifically incorrect under the control of the attacker. Um, and so your basic attack mode choice as an attacker can be either to just cause instantaneous bad data, get, make something go wrong right away, um, or to attack the data that's aggregated over time and attack the, the, map, the map and the inferences that the vehicle builds up. So uh, I'll take a look at some attacks on some of the various sensors. GPS uh, up first. Um, major reference for anything that can receive radio waves. Um, it's easy to deny. Uh, you can jam it. Um, you can buy a GPS jam cheaply uh, on any number of sketchy Chinese websites, um, or you can make your own. There are plenty of uh, schematics online. And all that's happening here is that you're just pumping out a bucket of radio frequency noise that overwhelms the, the small signals that are coming in from the satellites. Uh, GPS spoofing is also definitely a thing. Uh, what you do is you fake realistic looking GPS satellite signals at a higher power from your own device and cause something to think it's in the wrong place. Um, this was sort of first popularized by a group at uh, the University of Texas in Austin, uh, the Radio Navigation Lab. Um, and they showed this on civilian GPS, um, where they have a, an aerial vehicle here that's tracking the real GPS with three uh, virtual tracking points. And what they do is they move their fake signal um, until it's aligned with the real signal. Once they've captured uh, the GF GPS tracker on the vehicle, they can move that off and cause the vehicle to go wherever they want it to. So um, here, coming up soon, is a demonstration where they'll have a hovering uh, helicopter, UAV, and they'll convince it that it's drifting upwards. And so the automatic controller on board will move downwards to compensate. And if the safety pilot doesn't take over, uh, it will happily fly right into the ground because, as mentioned, there's almost no collision avoidance on any UAVs. So here, um, it's, the attacker has now taken control and they're slowly uh, convincing that vehicle that it's moving upwards, so instead it moves down to compensate. And until the safety pilot takes over, it was ready to go into the ground. That's the method that the Iranians claimed that they used for taking down this American military drone. Um, almost certainly not true, uh, because the military is well aware that this is a vulnerability. Uh, that's why there's a military authenticated GPS signal, and also why military vehicles tend not to rely on GPS, because GPS is very easy to do adversarial attacks onto. And we'll talk a bit about what, uh, what military vehicles do tend to use. Um, in the civilian realm, GPS 
all the time is the primary sensor. GPS and then perhaps resolving the last few meters with other sensors just to prevent last minute collisions. Um, and it's important to note that the sensors have filters on them. So the GPS is sort of just generally providing a, a kind of a pressure to keep the vehicle in the right track. Um, and then something else will, will be responsible for snap judgments. So here's an example from the second DARPA Grand Challenge. This is the vehicle that actually won it. This is called Stanley. And you can see here, it's on a perfectly straight road. There's no problem at all. But now, suddenly, it's like trying to drive off the road. What's going on here? The, the GPS and the local collision avoidance system are not agreeing. And the GPS is trying to drag it to where it thinks the road is. And at the last minute, the uh, collision avoidance is saying, wait a second, I don't want to be here. I want to be on this obvious road. Um, Here's another example from the DARPA Grand Challenge. This vehicle's traveling under just GPS control, and it just happily drives over a Jersey barrier <laughs> because its collision avoidance do uh, doesn't see it. We're not just talking about cars here. Um, boats are big consumers of GPS because when you're out in the middle of the ocean, there's no other reference. As far as you can see, it's water, and there's no other uh, navigation system either. There used to be a radio navigation system called Lorian. It was switched off. GPS is what they use. So once again, the UT uh, Radio Navigation Lab uh, thought about this, and they asked the owner of some mega super yacht, hey, can we see if we can take your yacht over with our GPS spoofer? And they said, oh, wait, I have this like huge yacht, and some hacker could just come and like, uh, you know, take, take, take it over? Sure, give it a shot. So they brought their um, GPS spoofing hardware on board. And when you're traveling thousands of kilometers on a boat, even small changes in direction can end, have the thing end up a long way from where it's supposed to be. So that in their attack here, they changed the heading reference by three degrees only. And so the automatic navigation system of the boat compensates just like the helicopter and drives it off track. And so when you're setting out to track across the ocean, um, you know, you, you could be, this could be directing you to a completely different country. Um, there's the uh, GPS track information. What's the hardware cost to do this? At that time, it was about $2,000. So you've got a multi-million dollar yacht being taken over by $2,000 in hardware. Um, and hardware for attacks just keeps getting cheaper. Um, at, at the time that, the, that that takeover was performed, uh, if you wanted to do this, you had to program your own GPS uh, information generator, which is not a trivial programming task. It's quite difficult. Um, but then hackers started presenting it at conferences. So this was from DEF CON 23. A Chinese team uh, developed their own with a Blade RF, and uh, the code was written in MATLAB. And they tested it out by taking it to car showrooms and convincing the car's navigation systems that they are in the middle of lakes. And uh, th that uh, sort of showed everyone, oh, this is, this is just in the realm of anyone. Um, and now, um, for doing a specific kind of GPS attack, a replay attack, you can download the ephemeris data from NASA for the current day. Uh, so that's exactly what, uh, it gives you the ability to generate exactly what the uh, satellites sending out in signals. You can take an open source tool from GitHub and you can generate uh, the radio frequency information to send to an SDR. You can take a hack RF for about $500 um, and start sending out that information. And although that's historical information, you can spoof, it, spoof the time on that and you can basically replay the day's GPS signals uh, to any devices in range and convince them they're somewhere else. So that's something that I've done on stage. Um, Troopers were, uh, we're, we're in a kind of a small room here. They weren't too comfortable with me flying a drone in here and taking it over. But um, if you have civilian drones that have no fly zone capability, then you can force them to land with just a hack RF and a Raspberry Pi. So uh, here's an example of me doing that. Um, on the left, this is the controller. Uh, and I'm, it's showing that I'm convincing with my uh, SDR that it's right in the middle of the Belgrade airport on the runway. Um, and the drone that's hovering right there in the front uh, of the presentation uh, is seeing that as a no-fly zone condition and landing. Um, obviously, if you're an owner of these drones, you can hack them and route them and get rid of the no-fly zone. But that's how they come out of the box. And so you can just have fun taking over, um, taking over com uh, commercial consumer UAVs. And that's with a hack RF and a Raspberry Pi, as I said. So it's about $500 in hardware. 
and you can just mess with everyone's civilian GPS. Uh, totally illegal in many countries. So, you know, obviously clerical. These guys, uh, this was in Serbia, and I asked, you know, hey, what do you, what do you think about, like, in the middle of the presentation room, you know, sending out fake GPS signals and forcing this UAV to land? And the conference organizer said to me, I said, you know, is, is that a legal problem for you? And he said, this is Serbia. It's anarchy here. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> All right, so from GPS to LIDAR. Um, LIDAR, as I said, basically a scanning laser rangefinder. Uh, these were for in originally designed for industrial automation, so in the factory, making sure people didn't walk into a dangerous, dangerous space um, or uh, have things go to the wrong place. Um, they mechanically scan a laser uh, across a, um, uh, a mirror or something like that and uh, primarily used for collision avoidance and map building. Um, then the robot people started saying, hey, these things are great. Why don't we slap a whole bunch of them to our robot? And then there started to actually be a commercial uh, LiDAR for robots space, mostly uh, dominated for the last few years by a company called Velodyne, um, although now a lot of really cheap ones are starting to come out of China. Um, uh, they can be denied by being uh, overpowered by a laser at the same frequency um, or uh, or by preventing that return signal from coming back somehow. Um, and we can also spoof light us by uh, manipulating the absorbance or reflectivity of the things that uh, are in the environment um, or by sending out active signals. I'll talk about all those things. Um, LiDAR as originally generated was basically 2D. Even the 3D LiDARs basically just have multiple 2D ones that are stacked up. Um, so here is uh, the pizza delivery robot, which uses a LiDAR as its primary sensor. Um, because it's 2D, it's highly orientation dependent. If you have a vehicle like the pizza delivery system that tilts a lot, uh, then the kinds of returns it gets back from the LiDAR change a lot. Um, and what that means is that inclines can look like obstacles, and it also means that the system can miss uh, low obstacles and discontinuities like curbs. So um, you can sort of trip a robot like this. As I mentioned, it's a, an active emission sensor. So what that means is it sends something out, it gets something back, it can only see something that returns a signal back to it. If it doesn't get a return, it means as far as it knows, there's nothing there. So that's an interesting way to look at the world. Most of the world returns no data at all. Anything above the horizon, anything that's out of range, nothing. Uh, that also means that things that absorb in the laser frequency also look like nothing. Uh, also transparent things that let the light go all the way through and all the way back um, look like nothing. So that enables these kinds of attacks where you can, uh, like the Wiley Coyote painting a, an absorbent tunnel, uh, it's on a wall that's going to look like a big hole in the wall that the vehicle may think it can drive through. Um, it also means that you can make obstacles that are transparent and the vehicle will not see them. Um, that's not, not, su not a super interesting result, but a bit more interesting is the fact that anywhere that it loses return for any reason on the ground um, can look like a ditch. So reflective things can really confuse the laser. Um, so a puddle, for example. Because now your outgoing signal is bouncing off, and where is it going after that? If there's something far away, that can be reflected through the puddle and look like it's close. Um, and then similarly, as I mentioned, if it just goes off into space, that looks like a giant hole in the road now. So uh, you can make reflective surfaces look like things that the vehicle won't consider safe to drive over because it just doesn't know anything about them. Uh, and oh, another thing I should mention, the vehicle already is programmed usually to ignore small holes because there are just so many of them just because of the way the LiDAR works. So the, the, what it's driving over already is kind of a patchwork. Um, this is uh, just a fun thing that, uh, that I found on the internet. Um, this is some documents that were captured from the, uh, an Al-Qaeda group uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and they talk about some of these techniques. So this is a reference to a Russian Rakal GPS jammer, uh, and down here is um, some counter drone uh, suggestions, such as using reflective materials to confuse uh, uh, laser-based target acquisition systems. Um, but that said, reflection is also a feature. Uh, they, uh, 
the, the uh, driverless vehicles that rely heavily on LiDAR uh, use it to do lane marking detection because lane markings are often difficult to see uh, visually. Uh, but the paint on the road is much more reflective than the road itself. Um, so basically, the system is looking for um, shapes in the, in, like holes that are shaped like things like road markings. Um, and that gives us an attack method. That means that we can um, fake road markings with black paint on a black road in such a way that they're invisible to a human driver, um, but that the robot has to pay attention to. Uh, so we can do things uh, like change, change the lane markings. Obviously, this can have fatal consequences, as in the case of that Tesla autopilot. Those weren't deliberately faked, but they were poor lane markings, uh, degraded lane markings. Um, or we can uh, use it to add things to the map that shouldn't be there. And we can like, sort of bite our time uh, and uh, make, make the uh, map having correct information in it. Or just have messages for the engineers uh, that might be going through and looking at that map later. Um, one, one final basic attack on the LiDAR. Um, the LiDAR provides limited transmittance information. Basically, things look solid or they look like they're not there at all. Um, so solid looking things, as far as the vehicle is concerned, are completely solid. So you can make uh, lightweight obstacles, uh, inflatable obstacles, things like that, looks completely solid uh, to the vehicle. So it's very easy to uh, force the vehicle to go a way that you think it should go or prevent it from going somewhere that you don't want it to go, with these low cost obstacles. Uh, but one thing that I'm really excited uh, to, to show you guys is some recent research in, uh, in jamming um, and active attacks on the LiDAR. Um, so this is where we've got our own laser system and we're using it to um, cause problems uh, for a LiDAR using vehicle. So first of all, denial. If we have a strong uh, LiDAR, a strong laser source, then we can overpower the LiDAR in a specific area. So we can choose things in the environment for it to miss. Um, so here is a multi-beam Velodyne LiDAR, this is research from Korea, um, and we're using a laser to take a specific part of that detection out of the vehicle's uh, frame, of, frame of vision. Um, but this is a bit more of an interesting result from that same research uh, in active spoofing. Um, uh, we can use a weak laser source uh, to cause false returns between ourselves and the, and the victim vehicle. Um, but what do you notice about these 360-degree 300, LIDARs? They're all, they all have curved glass on them so that it can have an uninterrupted 360-degree view. But that curved glass uh, actually gives the attacker a way to exploit uh, in an interesting way because the curved glass does refract. So if we tune our output power of our attacking system, we can actually refract our attacking beam around that glass and in to make it look like the fake returns are coming somewhere that we're not. So for example, we could set this up on an attacking vehicle and we could drive next to a driverless vehicle using a LiDAR and we could make it think there are obstacles in front of it even though we're not in front of it. Um, and it depends on the source strength. So here's an example from the paper. Um, the dots are a little hard to see um, on the screen, but basically the, the weak source produces returns between the attacker and the victim. Uh, and a stronger source here um, produces returns off at an angle. So that's a pretty cool result. Um, an even more sophisticated spoofing attack is a relay attack, just like in the case of the GPS relay, at relay attack, uh, where um, taking previously recorded information and giving it to the victim. Um, in this case, uh, the timing is really critical. So what's happening here is the laser is coming out at the speed of light. We don't have time to process that and send back a false return in the time that that pulse comes out. Instead, what we need to do is characterize the continuous pulses coming out of the LiDAR and craft our attack and then start sending that back with the correct timing. Um, so the timing is critical. We do need a characterization period. But once we've done that, we can induce fake returns basically wherever we like them. Um, in this case, we're inducing fake returns uh, further away than the attacker is from the, from the victim location. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're, put, we're placing our fake target returns in between ourselves and the victim. So um, 
a difficult attack to pull off practically since you need to know not only the location of the LiDAR but also characterize its timing and beam characteristics, but it is theor theoretically possible. Now, a lot of systems that uh, are out there in development right now are using LiDARs, but one uh, big example that are on the road already that doesn't use LiDAR is the Tesla Autopilot. So, you know, we talked about this, uh, unfortunately, from that fatal case study. Uh, Musk's opinion on this matter is that we do everything with vision basically on the road, so the car should be able to too. So they mostly concentrate on cameras. They do have one radar system for long distance um, obstacle and collision avoidance, uh, but mostly it's cameras. So talking a bit about cameras, um, they are used mostly for specialized object detection. So for example, street signs uh, and lane markings. Um, and sometimes we use uh, pairs of cameras to get a replacement for LiDAR, a noisy distance map. Um, but one area that uh, cameras have been used a lot is what's called colorizing the LiDAR. So even if you have a LiDAR, um, this was most famously um, popularized in the second DARPA Grand Challenge with the winning vehicle Stanley. Um, if you take a look at this video, the reason it was able to win was because it was able to drive much faster than any of the other vehicles. And the way it did that, it used its LiDAR to create a short range depth map, a short range map of go versus no go. This is safe to drive, this isn't. And then they checked the, the registered cameras for the color of the safe zones and extended that back out using simple computer vision techniques. So that allowed the vehicle to see the road, uh, the safe road, a long distance further than the LiDAR could capture. And so it was able to drive at high speed um, and was able to win uh, the, the competition on that basis. So color information can be really important. Cameras are easily denied. You can dazzle them with bright light sources. Um, and camera spoofing works the same way that we know it well from our own eyes by camouflaging things um, and by exploiting the assumptions that are made about color. Um, in the case of stereo cameras, repeating patterns cause big problems for building the depth map. Um, I just want to mention for the sake of completeness, because I know this is big right now, um, is adversarial trickery of machine learning vision systems. Um, so basically deep learning uh, vision recognition models are becoming all the rage. They're actually not used that much in driverless vehicles, um, but they, they can be used a little bit. Uh, and the way that you do it is you craft specific adversarial models that cause the vision recognition system to fail. So one of the most um, uh, well-reported examples of this is adding reasonably small de uh, deformations to a stop sign that prevented the system from recognizing it as a stop sign. You know, to us, we see a giant red hexagon, like what's wrong with you, robot? But there's like a few uh, pieces that have been stuck on it that cause the neural network system to fail. Um, another example is adding adversarial noise. So uh, you take your uh, AI machine learning system um, that's functioning, and then you figure out how to craft noise to add to the image that in this case will cause it just to completely not recognize a bunch of pedestrians in the road. Um, there are some problems with these in terms of a practical attack approach. Uh, mostly they're white box techniques, so you need to know exactly how this particular machine learning system works um, and then craft your adversarial approach. In the case of the second one here in adversarial noise, if you have the ability to add noise to the digital information from the camera before it gets to the computer, you already own that system, right? So it just is not relevant. Uh, but I include it for completeness. Um, also, a lot of these techniques don't work reliably outside the lab. Um, so it, when you parametrically distort, you know, if you don't get a complete front-on look at the object and so on, a lot of these techniques don't work. Here's one example which did work pretty well. Again, it's a white box technique. They knew exactly how their model worked, but they, they developed a system that they could 3D print textured objects and the camera would misrecognize them from multiple angles. This is pretty cool. So these little turtles that they printed were recognized by the machine learning vision system as rifles. Um, moving on to millimeter wave radar. This is another sensor that's uh, showing up in vehicle applications. Um, this is uh, what's in those scanners at the airport uh, that give the security staff a, a view of your genitals. Um, these in vehicles are primarily used for collision avoidance. So it looks for things that reflect radar pretty well, uh, like other vehicles. Um, it has lower resolution than the LiDAR, uh, so it produces kind of a fuzzy image. Um, and it's kind of, it's like walking through a hall of mirrors. It's like this weird well where there's just reflective things all over the place. So for fine decision making, it has limited utility. That's why the Tesla uses it for looking 160 meters out pretty much 
exclusively. Um, so uh, you can do denial on this as well. You can jam it um, with a appropriate RF signal. Um, you can use the techniques that the military uses for um, confusing radar-based tracking systems like missiles. So you can use ch fine chaff um, and then highly reflect things that are highly reflective in the laser's wavelength, uh, like overhead signs, can, uh, can affect things. So if you put just a big sheet of metal up over the road, then it can obscure the fact that there's anything underneath it. Um, here's an example uh, that was presented um, uh, at DEF CON 24. Uh, this is using a Bosch LRR3, which is the uh, example that the Tesla uses in its autopilot. Um, and this team from China showed that uh, armed with uh, an oscilloscope, a signal analyzer, a signal generator, um, a harmonic mixer, and a frequency multiplier, they could convince a Tesla autopilot uh, that a large object in front of it was not there. So it's been successfully jammed. Um, Unlike the GPS attack, which was cheap, this cost about $100,000 in equipment terms. So this is, uh, this is not an easy attack to perform financially. Uh, and these guys theorized spoofing and relay attacks, but did not perform them. Um, the inertial measurement unit and the compass, um, this, uh, as I said before, in, uh, integrates the output of accelerometers, gyroscopes, and magnetometers. So uh, it's an automated form of dead, dead reckoning. So these come at multiple price points. You can get your military grade systems or you can get your hobbyist uh, 10 or $20 systems. Um, and it's the primary navigation sensor for vehicles that can't rely on GPS because they're under the water or that won't, for example, because they're military systems. Um, and you can get some very high fidelity systems. So if you take the IMU from a Boeing 777, for example, its cumulative error is 0.1% of the distance traveled. So what that means is you put that on your underwater vehicle and you send your underwater vehicle 300, uh, 300 kilometers. At the end, when it gets to its destination, it's off by about 300 meters, more or less. Pretty, pretty accurate. Um, it's extremely difficult to interfere with these. That's why the military relies on them. But there are physical attacks that you can perform against them with such things as magnetic fields, uh, thermal attacks to take uh, advantage of the fact that the drift is different at different temperatures. And here's one that's actually really cool. This is an acoustic attack on an IMU uh, that was performed uh, by another Korean group um, uh, based on cheap MEMS IMUs. So a cheap MEMS gyroscope uh, is like a little, a little tiny chip. MEMS stands for Microelectromechanical System. Um, and it actually has little vibrating elements on the chip. Um, and a three-axis gyro has three uh, sensing modes. And these can be perturbed. They have a resonant frequency, and you can cause them to resonate with an external acoustic source. So this is a, a, ver a version of the attack that many of you may have heard of, the shouting in the data center attack. Um, was done years ago, and then it recently was in the news again, where if you play a really loud noise right next to a hard disk, uh, a spinning hard disk, you can vibrate its read head and cause it to, cause it to fail. Um, this works on MEMS gyros as well. So these guys took their acoustic blaster, uh, pointed it at a regular you know, commercial uh, consumer quadcopter, and you can see here, when they turn their audio on, the uh, control system goes completely nuts as it tries to uh, cope with all of that resonant noise being added to the gyros. So you can, you, and they did actually force a uh, quadcopter to crash just by blasting noise at it. So that's a, that's a pretty cool short range attack method. Um, wheel odometry, uh, these are the encoders that measure how much the wheel is spinning. It's just, it's just like uh, the odometer in your, in your car works the same way. Um, these are there because it's useful to know your true speed. Um, the GPS is not fully trustworthy on this, um, and it's useful to know when you're definitely stopped. So here's an example of an odometer-related uh, failure, uh, an encoder-related failure. This is our bridge crossing on Prototech This, where we're cars coming to deliver our pizza driverlessly, and this turn is hard even for human drivers. You can see how many vehicles have already crashed into that barrier. Ours scraped onto it too, and it scraped the encoder off. Uh, and as soon as that happened, the vehicle would start to move, and then the wheel says it's not moving, got super confused, uh, and the mission failed. So you can, uh, you can attack the odometer by scraping it off. You can also do things if you have physical access, like changing the wheel diameter, which will cause a false speed to be, re be reported. Um, 
give it uh, some slip, which it's not expecting. So this is why driverless vehicles are still struggle in the snow. Um, and as you saw their removal can cause full mission failure. Um, the ultrasonic sensors, I'm including these for completeness because the Teslas, the Audis, the Volkswagens, and Fords use these for automatic parking. Um, but they're only used at very slow speed, only used at, at, at close range at slow speed. So um, they're, they're not something that's like uh, that exciting to hack, uh, but you can hack them. So this is from uh, the DEF 24 presentation. Um, and you can see uh, a Tesla and an Audi uh, having their ultrasonic sensors jammed with ultrasonic noise. Um, and here, uh, spoofing a fake return by sending out carefully crafted ultrasonic pulses. Um, the ultrasonic sensors have a new, a, a different attack mode uh, that's kind of interesting from many of the other sensors. You can do cancellation. You can listen for the incoming pulses and you can send out an inverse pulse at the right time and do uh, acoustic wave cancellation so that um, the vehicle sees nothing there. Um, these are extremely low cost attacks, but obviously also extremely low impact. The vehicle's moving very slowly. It's just parking. Um, you probably can't even damage it. So uh, summing up all the sensor stuff, um, if we're going to equip our uh, James Bond uh, with something for dealing with uh, dealing with driverless vehicles on the road, um, we'd give him a GPS jammer. Uh, we'd give him some smoke or dust or vapor emitter uh, to block uh, an enemy lidar. Um, lightweight or inflatable decoy, decoy obstacles, shaft for the millimeter wave radar, transparent uh, tire puncturing devices and an oil slick device. Of course, every James Bond car has to have one. They work well on robots as well. Um, and then with the recent research into active attacks, we'd give it an active LIDAR uh, jammer and spoofer, active radar jammer, an acoustic blaster for the IMU, and an adversarial turtle dispenser. So that covers uh, the instantaneous attacks on the sensors. But there's one more really, really interesting uh, and important thing we have to talk about, which is the map. Um, even though Ernst Dickmans did these trips in the 80s and the 90s with just vision uh, and, and no um, uh, heavy duty map, it's really tough to make a vehicle super reliable just using the, the onboard sensors and logic. So real unmanned vehicle companies that are out there uh, putting great emphasis on pre-acquired map data. That's, that's why uh, companies like Google had to step up in that area because they were already building high fidelity maps. Um, and the map, in fact, is often considered to be the truth, just like we saw with Sandstorm. They had the GPS map. Um, they should have considered it to be the truth. The map is pretty reliable normally. Um, and it has advantages like reducing the amount of computation that has to be performed on the vehicle. Um, and it reduces the difficulty of recognizing things like traffic lights uh, and vegetation, stuff that can change in the environment. If, you, um, if it's all on the map, you don't have to work so hard on being able to recognize it visually. Um, and then other kinds of speed control and traffic management features that change. Uh, driving here uh, from the airport, getting into Heidelberg, there was a big uh, road closed system. Uh, um, and the, um, instead of having your driverless vehicle have to navigate all of these uh, you know, red cones and stuff like that, if, if the map is just constantly updated and it knows how to detour, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, so traffic lights are a great example. Um, traffic lights in general are hard to visually recognize. They can look very different. If they're off, you can't just look for a red, green, or yellow spot. Um, so the easiest thing to do is just have the camera know where to look. Have a camera that's pointed exactly uh, and windowing that image to say, I, I know where a traffic light is. Let me just see what the state of the traffic light is. I'm not recognizing the light. I'm just determining the state. But this makes one of those exploitable differences in the assumptions between the human and the vehicle. Because if you put a fake traffic light somewhere, or if you move a traffic light, um, a human is going to still pay attention to that traffic light. But if the robot's not looking for it, it can just bl blow right through it. Um, and a human's assuming a green light means they can go. They're not really careful about saying, OK, a car might be coming and going through the red light the other way. Obviously, they know what happens. But when we drive, we just don't think that way. Um, similarly with vegetation. Um, Let's say we've got some rules in our robot that say, say what's vegetation, uh, and can I drive over it or not? Obviously, I can drive over a grass, but, and maybe a small bush, but I don't want to try and drive over a tree. Um, so we do that often with colorized LIDAR uh, and some kind of a transmission classifier. You know, How much return do we get back on our LIDAR from this green thing 
So is that a bush or is it something more solid? But that can cause problems with overhanging foliage. Now we've got, you know, if a tree's grown a bit since the map was generated, now we've got all of this green stuff that we haven't seen before. We don't really know what it is. And I've been in a driverless vehicle that's got extremely confused by some trees that just weren't pruned lately. And it was stopping in the middle of the road, um, you know, being a hazard to other vehicles just because the trees had grown since the map was built. So dependence on the map can make these kind of fragile rules about how green something is versus how transmissive it is uh, and make them brittle, more brittle. Um, one more thing about the map, it requires constant updating. Um, so that's a, a vulnerability because if our map is local, if it's stored on the vehicle, then it's vulnerable to, to unexpected things that hackers may have placed in the real world that's not on the map. Um, however, if it's constantly updating the map remotely, now we've got all of our network attacks that we can apply against it. So we can deny it with, with uh, cellular jamming, um, and we can spoof it with standard man-in-the-middle attacks uh, and cellular, inter cellular intercept techniques. The goal of the attacker in all of this stuff um, is to exploit the logic structure that, was, that the designers put into the vehicle when they created them. So maximize the uncertainty that the vehicle has instantaneously in the moment. And the map, is also a boon to the attacker. They, at the, map, the attacker can also use the map uh, to decide when is the best place to attack a vehicle. So to take, for example, blind right turns and cause problems. And what we want to do here is just, maybe we don't even want to, want to make the vehicle have an accident, but uh, we want to make it require manual assistance, make the human have to take over, um, annoy and confuse the occupants, uh, inconvenience other users of the road, so we can look for these fragile maneuvers that we already know uh, they can have trouble with um, and use our map access. And maybe we can cause this kind of uh, uh, serious accident at an intersection. Um, so some basic logic attacks here, uh, which I'm, I'm sure uh, are, are obvious to you. Um, trapping and redirecting the robot. So attacking it at the collision avoidance and navigation layer, um, forcing it to postpone its high level missions. So we can take, uh, take advantage of dynamic obstacles um, in, in this, we see the pizza delivery robot encountering the dynamical obst dynamic obstacle of a dog. Uh, we can use our own robots. We can make obstacle swarms that can be, uh, uh, they can have uh, reflectance to certain sensors that's much higher than their, their actual physical pres presence. We can make artificial signage. Um, we can do things that human drivers wouldn't even notice, but the vehicle cannot ignore. Um, and then, of course, uh, causing mission failure by clobbering the vehicle, so basically making the robot run into something, subverting uh, the collision avoidance part of the stack. Uh, we might want to completely incapacitate the vehicle. Uh, we might want to just damage or remove sensors to make it more vulnerable down the track. Um, or we might want to cause subtle deviations to the map that we can exploit later. Uh, imitate light vegetation. Uh, which is not light, so it causes the vehicle to crash into it. Uh, we can simulate obstacles at speed to force the vehicle to take, uh, undertake dangerous avoidance uh, maneuvers. Uh, we can disguise the walls of entrances like tunnels and so on to make them, see, uh, make them seem larger than they really are so that the robot scrapes against them, um, especially if it's within GPS that can have several meters uh, worth of uncertainty to them. Um, and as I mentioned with the, with the millimeter wave radar, we can place obstacles underneath highly reflective objects. Uh, so as I get close to wrapping up here, um, I'm just going to give you this uh, humorous quote uh, just to manage our expectations about when um, we're going to see lots and lots of driverless vehicles out there. Uh, although I said they are coming, and they are, uh, it's going to be a while. Uh, this is showing uh, some of the ways that these uh, vehicles are not yet ready for prime time. But one thing that is supposed to start appearing soon uh, is connected vehicles. And so I just wanted to give a little quick introduction here for people that haven't uh, done any reading on the specification here. Um, this uh, is usually called V2V, Vehicle to Vehicle Communications. It's automated. And there's also V2I, Vehicle to Infrastructure. So the main uh, components of uh, V2V are preventing rear end collisions, uh, making lane changes safer, and making intersections, blind intersections, which as I mentioned before, places that driverless vehicles find uh, very fragile and dangerous, um, and make those safer as well. Right now though, all of these things are just warnings. 
There's no active control of the vehicle proposed for any of these things. So it's like when you go to change a lane, it uh, sends a lane change warning to another car. The another car says, hey, wait, I'm there. Two, don't change lanes. And it'll beep at you or flash something or say, hey, don't, don't change lanes right now. Um, the uh, components um, are these onboard and roadside communicators that use radio communications. Um, these, they're omnidirectional. It's called dedicated short range communications. 300 meters range, uh, 200, 200 to 500 bytes per packet. Um, and the protocol is called BSM, basic safety message. Uh, these packets are not encrypted. Yay. Um, however, they are authenticated with certificates, so PKI. Um, here's what the BSM protocol looks like. This is part one. Uh, it's what's called the core. Uh, so every message has this information. Um, and part two is append appended when it's changed, and it's specific to the type of vehicle. Um, one thing I'll draw your attention to is the fact that GPS data is unencrypted. So uh, that gives us feedback for our GPS spoofing. We can tell if it's working or not, because we can get these messages, and we can see where the vehicle thinks that it is. Um, Here's some of the, uh, a, a diagram which I know is quite dense um, about the security model of V2V. Uh, there's just a few things I'll draw your attention to. Uh, first of all, um, the initial de deployment is extremely limited. So the solid green lines there are not part of the initial deployment, only the dashed uh, green lines. So actually most of that roadmap is not part of the initial deployment. Uh, the certificates come pre-installed. Um, oh, I circled that there, initial full deployment. Uh, certificates come pre-installed, uh, so your car will come with like just a whole swag, basically a lifetime of certificates. Um, they're valid for five minutes each. And they still haven't decided yet about how renewal will work. Uh, if you go through all the ones that you come pre-installed with, updates, revocation of certificates, um, still TBD. Um, a lot more attention has gone into privacy. So some management functions are split to enable privacy protection, such as the linkage authorities, uh, and there's a location obscura for some functions too. So they're really thinking about uh, privacy, which is good. Um, but uh, there are still some questions to be answered because it'll be very easy to get valid certificates. So what about revocation? Uh, even though they're only valid for five minutes, that's a long time on the road when actually split second decisions are what we care about. So bottom line here on connected vehicles, um, it took 11 years for them to generate this white paper uh, of the specification. So very, very careful rollout. Um, and the actual rollout of the technology, they're expecting 37 years until the full civilian fleet has this stuff on board. Okay, So they're, they're taking it very slowly. Um, and they're paying more attention to government level malicious attacks, I guess, tracking and privacy than uh, the kinds of malicious attacks that we might be focused on. Um, and of course, all of the standard uh, public key infrastructure concerns. Um, and not even talking at this stage about direct control. So who knows? We might, have, we might actually have robots out there first. Uh, but keep, keep that 37-year rollout in mind when you're thinking about the timeline of this stuff. Um, and uh, just to sort of uh, you know, get, get this back to the sort of IoT focus here, um, just consider when you think about connected vehicles, the flaws that are already out there in the traffic sensors. So here's a, uh, just a reminder of DEF CON 22 uh, and ha hacking US traffic control systems. Um, what Cesar found was there was no encryption or authentication in these traffic sensors. They were doing wireless transmission in clear text, uh, much like uh, so the, the clear text like the uh, BSMs, but no authentication. Um, and the firmware updates, that's a really important part. Just because the, uh, the actual communications is done properly, how are they going to manage updates? In this case, neither encrypted nor signed. So you could just walk down the street and upload your own firmware to the traffic control systems. Right? So hopefully they won't make these exact mistakes, but no doubt they will make other mistakes. Um, and here is some like super, super um, fresh news uh, on this subject of the consequences of these types of attacks. So just last week, uh, a team from Georgia Tech uh, did some modeling uh, about hacked vehicles in Manhattan. Uh, they used percolation theory uh, to determine the network effects of large-scale connected vehicle hacks. So um, here's the normal road access with no disabled or hacked vehicles on the road. You only need a very small number of vehicles to be blocking physical connectivity on the roads before you cause utter traffic chaos. 
um, and you can cause loss of life even if there are no collisions because emergency vehicles can't get through. So if we hack just 10 vehicles per kilometer per lane in Manhattan, look at the difference in access of those roads. You've just blocked off almost everything that's not on the arterial thoroughfares, and if we double that uh, at rush hour, we've made just a complete mess of the entire city. So we really need to keep this stuff in mind uh, when we think about these as IoT vehicles. We don't want to make the same mistakes that have been made everywhere in IoT. You know, we don't want these connected vehicles to be like cheap Chinese webcams where someone with a botnet can basically take down a city. So we need to be thinking about it now. But all of that said, we of course are on, we're the good guys, uh, so don't do any of these things. Driverless vehicles are cool. We only do this for research purposes and to make the world a better place. Uh, don't hassle the Hoff, um, or rather don't hacksaw the bots. Uh, I know that uh, David Hasselhoff is very popular here in Germany. Um, we're going to use this information to design better systems before they get deployed. And we're going to do that by keeping adversarial hacking in the discussion. Um, so hopefully we can eventually live the dream. Um, we'll just sit, sit in the empty seats in the car. The car drives itself. Uh, to quote Austin Powers, while you shag, baby. Thank you very much.